A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Explain stuff. Hey everyone, Dr. D here, and in this video, we are going to be covering chapter 27 uh, from our Brock Biology of Microorganisms textbook. This chapter deals with adaptive, also known as specific immunity. This chapter, uh, you know, specific immunity in general uh, has a lot to do with specificity of a specific antibody against a specific antigen. So the adaptive immune system is based around very specific uh, B cell receptor or T cell receptor to antigen binding. And this, this specificity is found on lymphocyte cell receptors. So, like I said, the T cell receptor or the B cell receptor. So you can see antigen, antigen as we know, are any substance that can elicit an immune response that can be recognized by the immune system. And then you have your receptors. In this case, this is a B cell receptor, also known as an antibody. And uh, specific antibodies may or may not recognize different antigens. So what you need to know is that when you're dealing with B cells or T cells, each one has a specific, unique receptor on its surface. The B cell receptor, as you see here, the B cell receptor is also known as an antibody. And that antibody, you see the red part, the, the red part of this antibody, that's, that's a variable part. That part, every B cell has a unique shape to this part of the antibody, which, um, which means that every, uh, every um, B cell recognizes a slightly different antigen. So there may be a B cell in your body that recognizes this antigen. There may be a B cell that recognizes that antigen. There may be a B cell that recognizes this antigen. See the triangular antigen? This, this uh, lymphocyte is the one that recognizes this specific antigen. Again, this is based around specificity. And another key aspect of the adaptive or specific immune system is memory. Uh, you need to remember that antigen for future attacks. Uh, so this is, this is why the specific or adaptive immune system gets better with time. Because with each antigen exposure, there is a memory formed and your B cells and T cells will remember that antigen for the future. This is why vaccines are effective because memory B cells and memory T cells are formed and they live inside of your lymphoid tissues uh, for years and years where they will remember that insult in the future. So subsequent exposures, uh, you know, after the first exposure to the same antigen, this results in a rapid production of large quantities of antigen reactive T cells or antibodies from the, from the plasma cells uh, or the B cells. And again, uh, there's a very specific uh, binding of the antigen to the to the receptor and once that happens these memory cells become clones they divide to make multiple copies of themselves each one with the exact antibody on its surface that recognizes this antigen and that uh, elicits a collective immune response tolerance what does tolerance have to do with uh, adaptive immunity? Tolerance is the acquired inability to make an adaptive immune response to one's own antigens. So it's very important for your B cells and your T cells to uh, understand the difference between what are called self antigens and foreign antigens. Self antigens are proteins and other structures on the surfaces of your own cells. And your, your cells need to be able to discriminate between foreign uh, and host antigens. Because if it doesn't, and your B cells or T cells recognize your own antigens, this is how, we, how it leads to autoimmunity. Failure to develop tolerance may result in reactions against yourself. This is when your body uh, attacks itself, and this is called 
uh, autoimmunity, um, where you have autoimmune disorder, for instance. And how does immune response work? Uh, at day zero, you will have no antibodies in your, bo in your uh, body present for, uh, against a particular antigen, no, no uh, antibodies and no immune cells against this antigen. Upon antigen exposure, your body will produce over the next few weeks, your body will produce uh, Im immunity against that antigen in the form of immune cells and antibodies, and then that will dip over time. However, you have the second exposure called antigen re-exposure, and this leads to a more robust, a much stronger secondary response with a slower decline in immunity. So how does selection and tolerance work in T cells? Precursor T cells, they, trans they, they travel from the bone marrow to the thymus. And in the thymus, that's where they mature and are put under both positive and negative selection. During positive selection, the T cells that recognize major histocompatibility peptides are retained. So they have to be able to recognize your uh, marker on top of your nucleated cells called MHC. If they recognize MHC, they are retained. Then there's negative selection. T cells that pass the positive selection and strongly bind to self antigens are selected against. So if the T cell is trying to react against your own proteins, then the T cell is deleted. This is called clonal deletion. Clonal deletions, what is that? More than 99% of T cells that enter the thymus do not survive the selection process. That makes sense. You only want to keep the T cells that recognize foreign antigen and not the T cells that rec recognize self antigen. Remaining T cells react strongly with foreign antigens. What about the B cells? Same thing with the B cells. We need to select for tolerance here and specificity. The body produces thousands of different B cells, each able to react to different pathogens um, and different antigens on those pathogens. So again, each B cell has a very specific B cell receptor called an antibody on its surface, and there are millions of different uh, antibodies on the surface of these, of these different B cells. Each B cell recognizes a very specific antigen. Uh, same thing with the T cells. They have T cell receptors on their surface and each T cell recognizes a very specific antigen. So uh, positive B cell selection occurs when a B cell receptor encounters an antigen that it recognizes. Upon recognition, B cells proliferate, which means they make more copies of themselves. They differentiate so they can become memory cells or plasma cells. Plasma cells release antibodies. Memory cells linger in the body uh, in order to re recall previous insults, previous uh, antigens. And then they produce proteins called antibodies. We're going we're gonna, to uh, break this down. I'm going to break this down for you, how exactly a B cell reacts to antigens, like how a B cell gets activated. We're going to talk about this all. And then negative B cell selection occurs in the bone marrow where self-reactive B cells are deleted. This is called clonal deletion. So again, if the B cell recognizes self proteins, that's not good because that could lead to autoimmune disease. This is where this, the B cell is deleted. It it's, uh, undergoes apoptosis. And here's a graphical representation of that process. You've got your bone marrow stem cell, a hematopoietic stem cell starting to become of the B cell lineage. Then there's exposure to antigen, uh, and then subsequent exposure with, B, with the T cells. And then once you have exposure to antigen and exposure to T cells, these, these cells are able to multiply and differentiate, proliferate and differentiate into plasma cells that secrete antibodies and memory cells that retain that knowledge for later. Okay, so again, I'm going to break this down uh, soon in the video, so don't worry uh, too much at this point. I'm going to tell you step by step how a B cell gets activated. Okay, so one thing to know about these immunogens, immunogens are anything that can elicit an immune response. Uh, immunogens and antigen binding 
antigens are substances that react with antibodies. These are the B cell receptors or the T cell receptors. Not all antigens are immunogens. Remember, immunogen means substance that elicits an immune response. Intrinsic factors that determine immunogenicity include size. Haptens are small molecules, but not immunogens. Complexity. The complex proteins and uh, carbohydrates are good immunogens, while things like fats and lipids, they are not good immunogens. And also, uh, repeating units like DNA, these are not good immunogens either. Physical form. Insoluble molecules or aggregates are usually excellent uh, immunogens. However, once something is solubilized in solution, it is not as good of an antigen. There are some extrinsic factors as well that determine immunogen-antigen binding. Intr uh, extrinsic factors. Uh, dose, you know, uh, you know, what is the dose of the of the uh, immunogen? Route is the immunogen, uh, you know, is the immunogen ingested orally or is it given as an injection? Injected, injected immunogens are more effective. Uh, in, I should say, injected antigens are more effective at eliciting uh, immune response. This is why vaccines are given as, a, as an injection. A large oral dose of an immunogen may actually be build tolerance rather than immunity, which is the opposite of what you may want. This is why you would not get a, a vaccination orally. So antibodies do, do not interact with the entire antigen. Because remember, an antigen is just anything that is foreign or any, any structure that could elicit an immune response, right? Um, the, there, an antigen can be quite large. Uh, so only the distinct portion of the antigen called the antigenic determinant or epitope is recognized by antibodies. I'm going to show you a picture of this in just a second. So this may include sugars, amino acids, and other organic molecules. Because antigens need to be associated with major histocompatibility complex to be recognized by T-cell receptors, only short peptide sequences are recognized by T-cell receptors, not entire proteins. So take a look at this. Here is an antigen. You see, this is a whole protein. This whole protein is, is called an antigen. But look at these little antibodies, AB1, AB2, AB3. See, these little antibodies, they don't recognize the entire protein. They recognize, like this, this antibody is recognizing just this part of the protein. That's called an epitope of the protein. This, this antibody is recognizing this epitope of the protein. And, the, and this antibody is recognizing a different epitope. So, so and, and keep in mind, each one of these antibodies came from a different B cell. So one B cell produced this antibody, which recognizes this epitope. A different B cell re uh, produced this antibody, which recognizes this epitope. And yet a third B cell produced this antibody, which recognizes this epitope. So let's talk about how uh, adaptive immunity works. Uh, there can be active adaptive immunity and passive adaptive immunity. Let's learn about what the difference is between the two. The immune response may be active, which is generated from actual exposure to an antigen, or passive, which means you get a transfer of already made antibodies or immune cells uh, from someone else. Active immunity develops memory cells, therefore you are actually become immune, you develop a long-lasting immunity. Passive immunity consists of preformed antibodies from someone else or cells that have a rapid effect but don't actually confer lasting immunity. So let's look at some examples. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to give you some examples, but first I'm going to tell you about natural immunity versus artificial immunity as well. Natural immunity means that no medical intervention was needed for this type of immunity, whereas artificial immunity requires injections or infusions in a in a medical setting. So let's talk about some examples of what we just talked about. Active versus passive immunity, natural versus artificial immunity. Let's talk about this. So natural active immunity is getting a disease and recovering. You know, it's, it's active because 
that when you get the disease, you get the antigen, and it's natural because it did not require a hospital type setting or infusion or in injection. Natural passive immunity, on the other hand, this is this is another natural non-medically induced passive immunity. So passing antibodies to nursing infants through breast milk, for instance, when when babies uh, feed uh, with uh, breast milk, <clears throat> they actually obtain antibodies from the mother, and these antibodies serve as passive immunity. This does not confer a long-lasting immunity in the child, but only a temporary immunity in the child. Artificial active immunity. This one would be induced medically and uh, with an antigen. This is like, a, a, for example, receiving a vaccination shot and developing immunity. Conversely, artificial passive immunity, the example here would be receiving a preformed antibody. So this is called anti serum. You know, when they, when they ask for uh, plasma donations from people who have recovered from a disease, this is what we're talking about. We're going to harvest those antibodies and we're going to use those to help people who need it right away you know and this does not confer long-lasting immunity so it's important to understand that these b cells with their b cell receptors called antibodies the b cells have approximately um, 100,000 of these antibodies uh, or B cell receptors on their surface, but all of the 100,000 are identical to one another. And no two B cells in your body would have the same exact uh, shape of antibody, exact uh, vari variation, and, re ex and recognize the same exact antigen. These B cell receptors encounter antigen and internalize it. They present antigen to helper T cells on MHC2 molecules, and I'm going to explain how exactly this works in a little bit. I'm going to draw it out for you. With T cell help, they proliferate and differentiate into plasma cells and memory cells, which provide long-term protection. So this is how it works. This is how a B cell is activated to differentiate and proliferate, uh, and and the the steps associated. So let's let's take a trip over to the whiteboard, um, the virtual whiteboard, and I will explain these steps, and then we'll be right back. Testing, testing. All right, everyone, welcome to the first ever virtual whiteboard. So let's see how this works out. Now, for the activity of B cells and helper T cells, let's start with a B cell. Okay, here's the cell itself. And on the surface of that cell, you're going to have a series of... Uh, you're going to have a series of receptors... And actually, they are not just receptors, they are antibodies, right? So I'm going to draw some antibodies on the surface of our B cell. And remember, each B cell has a very unique antibody on its surface, and it has many, many copies of that antibody, uh, tens, at least tens of thousands of copies of that antibody on its surface. So let's say uh, this B cell were to uh, encounter an antigen. So antigen comes along. That would be a uh, like a virus particle in pink here. You've got your viral particle. It binds specifically to this antibody. And what this is going to trigger is it's going to trigger phagocytosis by the B cell. And again, this is a B cell. And you're going to trigger phagocytosis, so the membrane is going to engulf this antibody as well as the antigen it has associated with. And remember, out of the whole body, maybe only one or two B cells in your whole body would have the correct antibody to recognize this particular virus. But once that binding occurs, there's this phagocytosis that occurs, 
And what you're going to have is an internalization of this whole thing. This whole thing is going to get internalized into what's called a phagosome. In the phagosome will be that antibody that was internalized as well as your uh, viral particle, right? Your, your, your virus, virion. Then at that point, the phagosome, oops, the phagosome will also fuse with a lysosome. So this guy is your lysosome. And remember, the lysosome is an organelle inside of uh, animal cells that's full of hydrolytic enzymes. So I'm going to draw all these hydrolytic enzymes. See, these green things are hydrolytic enzymes. These are enzymes that break down biomolecules, correct? So what's going to happen is the lysosome will fuse the lysosome will fuse to the phagosome and they will kind of become one. They will become one. So it will become what's called the phagolysosome, right? Now, you have hydrolytic enzymes here with the with the uh, with the viral particle, and what you're going to get is digestion of this viral particle. You're going to th that viral particle will get digested, okay? And then now you have chunks of the virus here. These are small peptides of the virus. Next, what happens is because the B cells are also professional antigen presenting cells, what's going to happen next is one of these one of these is going to conjugate to your um, MHC MHC class two major histocompatibility class two protein, and that's going to be presented on the surface of the cell. So what you're going to get is you're going to get your MHC class two, and it is going to present outside that chunk of a viral particle, okay? It's called the antigen from the virus. Now, at this point, we call the B cell a partially activated B cell. So you could say the B cell is half activated. The B cell is not fully activated yet. The way a B cell becomes fully activated is upon recognition of this uh, antigen by a helper T cell. So let's go ahead and draw a helpful helper T cell here. Oh, I didn't want to make it in red. I'm sorry. Uh, maybe I'll just erase this. Still getting the hang of this, you guys. So I want that. And uh, I want to change the color. How do I change the color of the shape? Uh, still learning. Um, basic shape. Okay, now it's now it's back to the black color. So here is your T cell, and this is a CD4 positive T helper. So TH means helper T cell, helper T cell. And the helper T cell has T cell receptors on its surface. So remember, each one of these, you know, are unique to this particular helper T cell. And in your body, you have all these different helper T cells. And let's say only one, this one, this, this helper T cell, this is the one that recognizes this antigen. So out of the millions of different CD4 positive helper T cells in your body, this might be the only one that recognizes that particular antigen and it will bind to this antigen. So you're going to get this kind of binding, this recognition of this antigen as well as the MHC2. And that's great because that's going to, whoops, that's going to activate uh, this B cell. So what's going to happen is CD4 will release Grant, uh, release signaling molecules, cytokines. It will release cytokines. 
and CD4 is releasing these cytokines, and that's going to activate, fully activate the B cell. So now the, the B cell is no longer one half activated, it is now fully activated. And once a B cell is fully activated, it will do two things, okay? It will proliferate and differentiate. Proliferate means make multiple, multiple copies of itself, and differentiate means become different types of cells. So it will become what are called memory B cells. These are responsible for remembering this particular antibody because th this antibody is very important on its surface. It's the one that recognizes this particular antigen. Okay, so in, in the case that in the future this particular virus gets into your system again, it's gonna it's gonna recognize it right away. Whoops. And it can take action right away. Whoops. I lost my cell. Again, sorry, I'm getting the hang of this still. Does that make sense? So, um, memory B cells linger in the immune system, and the memory B cells will will get triggered much more easily next time an antigen is present in the cell. The same antigen that was present last time, the same virus that was present last time. If, and this is how immunity works with adaptive immunity, specific immunity. This is why vaccinations work, because these memory B cells are formed, and then they linger in your lymphoid tissues. And next time that particular insult is present, then the uh, memory B cells, without the help the, without the help of the helper T cells, the memory B cells can activate and they will then proliferate and differentiate themselves. Now, what are you differentiating to? Not just memory B cells, but you're also going to differentiate into these massive, uh, what are called plasma cells. These are called plasma cells. And what plasma cells do is they they take this, this antibody, remember uh, the antibody on the surface of the B cell, and they will actually release that antibody into the serum. They will make soluble versions of this antibody and release it into the serum. So now you have tons and tons, tens of thousands of these antibodies flooding the blood. Okay, and the purpose of that is so that if in you know in your body somewhere, if there's a virus hanging out somewhere in the body, then the idea is that one of these serum antibodies will stick to it like this, okay? And if a serum antibody sticks to the virus, wherever it is in the body, this will what's called opsonize. It, this the, the antibody will opsonize the virus, making it readily uh, recognizable by cells of the body like the phagocytes, like the macrophages, which will readily recognize opsonized uh, antigens and phagocytose them, clearing them from the system. So that's kind of how it works. Here you see, again, the utility of the helper T cells. Without the helper T cells, then uh, B cells cannot get fully activated. And then with the help of helper T cells, B cells become fully activated to proliferate and differentiate into memory B cells and plasma cells. And then those plasma cells, they secrete tons and tons of the, the antibody, the one that recognizes this particular antigen, and that opsonizes the antigen for phagocytosis by the phagocytic cells of the immune system. So hopefully this made it clear what the B cells and the helper T cells do. And uh, let's go back to the main lecture at hand. All right, welcome back from that. So as you saw, you have your helper T cells, the activated helper T cells, which can recognize antigen presented by MHC2 on a B cell, 
And that B cell, remember, was a B cell that had bound to a, an antigen that it happened to recognize, right? It's like a one in a million shot. The antibody recognized an antigen. The, uh, the antibody internalized the antigen. The phagosome uh, bound to a lysosome and formed a phagolysosome. The parts of this antigen were then presented uh, on MHC2, major histocompatibility complex 2, to the helper T cell, which then fully activated the B cell. The B cell was then able to proliferate and differentiate into memory B cells and into plasma cells that release antibodies into the serum. So another word for antibodies is immunoglobulins or IGs. We're going to be talking about different types of IGs in a little bit. These are either soluble proteins or cell surface antigen receptors on B cells. They can bind to toxins or viruses and neutralize them. I'm going to show you how that works in the next slide. And they can bind to foreign cells and make them easier to engulf by phagocytes. Anytime that there is a binding to foreign cells to make them easier to be engulfed, this is called opsonization. So antibodies, every time antibodies bind to uh, an antigen, making it easier to engulf that antigen, this is called opsonization. So here you can see what normally happens when a cell encounters a toxin. The toxin touches the cell and then the toxin damages the cell. However, if there are antibodies against the toxin, then the antibodies will bind to the toxin and that can actually neutralize the toxin so the toxin can no longer bind to the cell and the cell is not damaged. Now I told you there are different forms of immunoglobulins or antibodies or immunoglobulins are protein molecules that interact specifically with antigenic determinants. You can find them in serum, milk, gastric secretions. There are five major classes, which we'll be going over the IgG, IgA, IgM, IgD, and IgE. These are different classes of immunoglobulins. The heavy chains of a given antibody define its class, whether it's G, A, M, D, or E, based on the amino acid sequence of the heavy chain. All five classes have different structural characteristics, expression patterns, and functional roles. IgG is the most common antibody, and it's the most common antibody circulating in the body. There's four peptides that make up IgG and most antibodies. Um, there's two heavy and two light chains. I'm going to show you a picture of this in just a little bit, how uh, an antibody is put together. Antigen binding uh, the antigen binding site results from interaction between heavy and light chains. And remember, there are billions of different antigen binding sites. So here is a antibody. And in this triangle up here, this brown colored triangle is the antigen. And remember, each antibody recognizes a very specific antigen. You know, and, and you don't typically have multiple different antibodies recognizing the same antigen usually. So what do you have? You have uh, an antibody is actually uh, a quaternary structure of four different proteins. You have, look at my uh, laser pointer right here. This is, this is a light protein. This is a, this here is, is one protein right here. This is one protein. And this is another protein that's identical to it. Okay, this is called the light chain. The light chain, see? Uh, and this one here, if you look at this where I'm tracing, this is a longer protein. This is called the heavy chain because it's longer. And this is an identical heavy chain. So each antibody is actually a quaternary structure of four different proteins, two identical light chains, and two identical heavy chains. And then do you notice that each of the proteins has a red region called the variable region and a blue region called the constant region? This is by design, the variable part, the red part, is variable because each antibody has a different amino acid sequence on the variable part. And that's why it recognizes very specific antigen. The blue part of an antibody is called the constant region because it's not variable. It is constant for all antibodies in the body. 
So what about some of these other classes and their functions? IgM is usually an aggregate of five immunoglobulin. That kind of forms a star shape. I can show you that. Uh, dimers of IgA are present in body fluids, and they help, uh, you know, against, uh, you know, uh, it, infection. They help when bacteria try to get in through the mucosal membranes. IgE is found in serum and functions as an antibody that binds to eosinophils. Remember the white blood cells called eosinophils. And IgD is, a, is present in serum and has no known function. So here's the antibody. Uh, this is what uh, the antibody looks like for IgG, IgA, and IgD. Again, you have uh, your antigen in brown. You have your two identical light chains and two identical heavy chains. You have in blue your constant region and in red your variable region. Here is IgM and IgE. This one has a slightly longer constant region or heavy chain, I should say. The heavy chain is longer here. Uh, otherwise, it's very similar. And remember, IgM forms this pentamer, this star-shaped pentamer. IgA is a dimer. Okay, and what happens uh, after antigen exposure? So when, when the body uh, is exposed to an antigen, how, how does the process play out? So after initial antigen exposure, called primary antibody response, your body produces a short-lived uh, plasma cells, short-lived plasma cells that live for less than a week and they produce mostly IgM, remember the star-shaped uh, grouping of uh, immunoglobulins, which, are, uh, which rises in the blood and measures by antibody titer. This means, you know, how many antibodies do you have in your blood? Then later on, uh, secondary antibody response. This is if you have another exposure to the same antigen. The memory cells that formed uh, during the primary antibody response the, the memory cells do not need T helper help anymore, T cell help anymore. Antibody response is quicker and it produces 10 to 100 times more antibody, this time IgG. So let, let's take a look at this antibody, antibody kinetics here. Upon initial exposure, you have no antibodies. Then you have a slight increase in serum antibodies, and these are the IgM variety, which tapers off over time. However, upon secondary exposure, let's say at day 100, you have a more robust uh, response, antibody response, due to the memory cells, which no longer need helper T cell help. And this is mostly a IgG response, and the tapering is much slower. So the variable domains of the antigen. The variable domains of different antibodies are different from one another, especially complementary determinant determining regions or CDRs. Again, remember each antibody is different from another B cell's antibody. Each B cell has a unique antibody on its surface and it's because of these CDRs that are different. The antigen binding site of an antibody is large enough to accommodate the binding of an epitope with both the heavy and light chain variable regions. Binding is ultimately a function of the folding pattern of the heavy and light polypeptide chains. So you see here, you have your antibodies. Remember, they're shaped like Ys. You've got the light chains and the heavy chains. And it's these CDR regions, see? CDR1, CDR2, CDR3. It's these CDR regions which make up the variable region of the antibody and are responsible for antigen binding. So the immune system must be able to generate an almost unlimited antibody variation. How did, how did we do this if we have a finite number of genes? We don't have a million different genes, right? But we can make a million different kinds of antibodies. How? The ability to, pr to produce almost limitless antibody diversity is due to what's called somatic recombination, random heavy and light chain reassortment, coding for joint diversity and hypermutation. The combination of these four, these four uh, events results in the sheer you know, numbers of antibodies that we can form. So genetic organization of the immunoglobulin molecule. How does it work? The gene encoding each immunoglobulin is constructed from several immunoglobulin gene segments. 
These are genes in pieces hypothesis. Once one antibody rearrangement is successful, uh, the process stops. This causes each B cell to rearrange and express only one antibody, even though B cells are diploid and could potentially express two different alleles if they were heterozygous and both chromosomes were rearranged. But only one of the alleles is rearranged and the other one is shut off. This is called allelic exclusion. So here's what's happening in the allele that's not shut off. Here's the, here's the allele that's expressed. You have many different variable regions. These are the, you have like 65 different variable regions for, for uh, you know, let's say the IgM heavy chain. Uh, you, you, you're during, during uh, somatic recombination, your cell, your B cell, as it's being formed, will pick one. So in this case, it picked uh, the variable region three. And then there are about 27 uh, other regions. Uh, there's an exons called the diversity genes. And it picks diversity gene one in this case. It could pick any one of these 27. And then there are the joining genes, and that's J1, uh, J2, J through J6, and in this case it picked J2. So it, it could have picked any one of these VDJ genes. And then the constant regions, these constant regions, you know, mu, gamma, uh, etc., these constant regions dictate the uh, identity of the aminoglobulin. So is it IgM, is it IgG, is it IgA, etc.? So this is how the somatic recombination works. You pick a random V of a random D of a random J and a constant region, and then this is spliced together uh, and forms the protein. And the light chain's the same way, the kappa light chain. There are 40 different variable regions to pick from. In this case, it picked variable region two, and then there's about five different joiners. It picked one and then a constant region here to make the light chain. So through the genetic organization of immunoglobulin molecules, at least 1.92 million possible antibody can be expressed. And then, and then we have antibody diversity exacerbated by somatic hypermutation. So uh, these variable regions can be mutated. This leads to a small changes in the variable regions. Somatic hypermutation causes changes in binding affinity that, when combined with decreasing antigen concentration, cause affinity maturation. So this means that yeah, the antibody might bind better to the antigen. And here's the assembly process. You've got the heavy chain, the light chain coming together to form an IgM. Now, uh, before we talk about MHC proteins, major histocompatibility complex one and two, let's take a quick little break time with Gizmo and Wicket, see what they're up to, and we'll be right back with more. All right, welcome back from break time with Gizmo and Wicket. Let's go ahead and keep moving forward with this chapter. Where we left off, we we're about to discuss class one and class two MHC proteins. Uh, again, uh, these are major histocompatibility complex proteins. Uh, these are also called human leukocyte antigens or HLAs in humans. MHC class one are found on all nucleated cells in your body. And what they do, uh, I'm going to explain this on a, another, uh, you know, uh, virtual whiteboard talk in a minute. But what these uh, nucleated cells do is that they present internal antigen to the CD8 positive T cells. These are known as the cytotoxic T cells or the CTL cells. Um, if you present cytoplasmic antigen. Uh, it could either be viral protein, cancer proteins, or self proteins. If self proteins are presented, the T cells will just scan and move by. But if viral proteins or cancer proteins are presented, then the CD8 positive T cells will destroy that sick cell. And the cell is targeted by those 
T cells, those CD8 positive cytotoxic T cells. And it's important to understand that MHC1, these are important proteins uh, for tissue transplantation because everyone's MHC class 1 uh, is a little bit different unless you're a close family member or a twin in which case you have very similar major histocompatibility complex 1 proteins. But if your MHC1 proteins uh, are not closely related to mine, then we can't, uh, you know, be candidates for tissue transplantation. Like if I have to donate a kidney or something, you know, it might get rejected because of differences between our MHC1 class protein structure. So here you can see the MHC proteins. You've got class 2 and class 1. Uh, class 1 is found on nucleated cells. Class 2 is found on uh, antigen presenting cells. And what class 1 does, class 1, uh, what, what, what happens is a cell, this is an infected cell. You see the virus. The virus will infect this cell and begin replicating. Some of those proteins, those uh, foreign proteins from the virus, will get chopped up by an uh, enzyme known as proteasome. And those peptides, those small uh, protein fragments called peptides, they will get transported into the endoplasmic reticulum where they will meet up with MHC class 1. MHC class 1 will then move uh, via secretory vesicle to the membrane, the plasma membrane, and then present. You see, it will present the, the, the antigen, that short peptide outside. So you've got MHC class 1 presenting antigen to the CD8 positive T cell. It's recognized by its very specific T cell receptor. And remember that uh, out of millions of T cells in your body, maybe one or two might recognize this particular antigen with its T cell receptor. So how do MHC class 2 proteins work? We talked a little bit about this previously. MHC class 2 proteins are found on the pre professional antigen presenting cells, such as the dendritic cells, macrophages, and B cells. Remember what these do? They present the internalized antigen uh, to CD4 positive T cells. They can activate helper T cells, and they receive helper T cell help. So again, the way these work is, for example, this is a B cell. The B cell has uh, these B cell receptors called antibodies on the surface. If that binds to a foreign protein or, let's say, a virus, it could phagocytose that uh, virus. It will then uh, chop up. It will chop up the peptide, the foreign pep, the foreign protein, into small peptides. Conjugate the peptide with MHC class two, and present MHC class two uh, with the antigen to uh, uh, on the surface of the cell. And this is recognized by CD4 positive helper T cells. And remember, only the specific helper T cell with the specific antigen. Uh, sorry, with the specific T cell receptor can recognize that antigen. Out of the millions of helper T cells, maybe only one may recognize that particular antigen. So let's talk a little bit about what makes MHC molecules different among people. Well, it's a, it's a combination of polymorphism and polygeny, uh, and these are, you know, uh, this is what gives the combination of the two give uh, variation among MHC molecules. So MHC molecules are polymorphic, meaning they have many, many different alleles for each of the genes. They are also polygenic, meaning there are many genes, each with many alleles that determine the MHC molecules a person will express on their tissue. So you see the combination of the two, polymorphism and polygenicity, um, the, the, it gives a great variety to the MHC molecules, and this is why it's hard to find a close tissue match or a M MHC match for tissue donation. This is why only closely family, closely related family members are likely to have the same MHC genes, and why organ donation between family members have a greater chance of success and less chance of rejection. So here you can see polymorphism in action. So 
you know, even along, even among the same gene, you could have a variation of that gene. These would be like alleles, different alleles for the same gene uh, that that could you ex express, or polygenic uh, traits as well, where you have multiple different genes that could make up the uh, the composite of the of the MHC molecule. Um, and again, MHC proteins expressed on the surface of the cell represent uh, composition uh, of the proteins inside the cell because they're constantly presenting protein from inside of the cell, uh, be it self-protein or foreign protein. Uh, we talked about these. Yeah, we talked about this stuff. So here you can see what happens. Uh, again, um, we have... Uh, let's say a macrophage. This is a professional antigen pre presenting cell. It has MHC2. MHC2 presents pa uh, antigen, which can be recognized by a specific T cell receptor on a helper T cell, a CD4 positive T cell, which then can release cytokines in order to promote things like inflammation. Um, uh, the, the, these, these MHCs can also present to helper uh, TH2 cells, helper 2 cells, which will then go on to fully activate B cells as well. Uh, conversely, on MHC1, this presents antigen to a, t a CD8 positive cytotoxic T cell with a very specific T cell receptor. And this, once activated, uh, once activated this cytotoxic T cell will release perforin and granzyme in order to puncture holes into the target cell as well as initiate uh, program cell death or apoptosis. So we're going to talk about that. In fact, let me talk about that in the whiteboard, uh, you know, digital whiteboard uh, uh, presentation now. All right, so in this virtual whiteboard, we will be exploring the cytotoxic T cell activity, but first let me draw for you a typical nucleated cell. This is any cell in your body. This could be a skin cell. It could be a liver cell. It could be a, I don't know, uh, a heart cell. Any cell in your body. This cell has on its surface what is called MHC1, major histocompatibility complex 1, on the surface of this nucleated cell. And all the nucleated cells in your body, including the professional antigen presenting cells, also have a MHC1. And what MHC1 does is it finds <clears throat> and it, it takes any kind of proteins or antigens from inside and it presents them out. So the green antigens I just drew, these are antigens. Uh, the green antigens would represent what's called self antigens. Uh, what the nucleated cells do is they take a random, random assortment of antigens from inside and present it out. So you see this is a this would be an example of a self antigen on the surface of the cell. Um, now if the, if a self antigen is presented on the surface of the cell, that's no big deal and nothing really happens. However, let's say this cell becomes infected with a virus. okay Here is a virus and that virus gets into the cell. And that virus starts making viral proteins. Well, what could happen is, whoops, did not want to delete that. I wanted to delete these. Now, what could happen is your MHC class 1 could take that uh, viral protein and present it on the surface of the cell. So now you've got your MHC class 1 but now it's actually presenting not self-protein, but it's presenting part of that viral protein I told you about. Now this is where your friend, the cytotoxic T cell comes into play. And I did not want to make that red. 
but for whatever reason oh there we go black awesome so this guy is your cytotoxic T cell also known as a cytotoxic T lymphocyte <clears throat> or either one of these works TC cell CTL cell Th these are your cytotoxic T cells and on the surface they have a very specific T cell receptor again I did not want to do that I don't know why it keeps doing that there we go I'll get the hang of this soon I'm sure but here we go now remember each T cell in your body including these cytotoxic T cells have what's called a T cell receptor TCR and every T cell has a very specific T cell receptor most of the T cells in your body are not going to recognize this antigen at all okay um, there might be one T cell with the right T cell receptor to actually recognize that antigen right but let's say this is the T cell that does recognize that antigen it will bind okay and it will I it will identify that antigen as foreign antigen and then at that point it will release what are called granzymes and perforin okay perforin and granzymes the perforin will perforate the cell which means like poke holes in the cell the granzymes will promote apoptosis which means program cell death did you see that so that's what happened the cytotoxic T cell recognized foreign antigen on the surface of this nucleated cell it then released granzymes to promote apoptosis perforin to perforate the cell and at this point also the T cell uh, the cytotoxic T cell becomes you know just like before I mentioned it proliferates and differentiates because it's now activated it is now activated and when it does proliferate and differentiate it forms memory uh, T cells uh, cytotoxic T cells or CTLs uh, these will remember remember the the insult for next time and by the way these are CD8 positive cells these are your CD8 positive cells and they will also form <clears throat> the cytotoxic T cells the, the effector cells as well which will go on and find any other such antigen on other cells and destroy those cells okay so this is the function of the CD8 positive T cells in your body what they do is they seek out your own nucleated cells that are presenting foreign antigen and if their T cell receptor happens to recognize that foreign antigen it will promote apoptosis of that particular nucleated cell in your body and then its job is to remember these cells and to attack those cells all right so I hope this makes sense let's go back to your regularly scheduled lecture all right welcome back from the virtual whiteboard hopefully that made it clear how the cytotoxic T cells work so cytotoxic uh, T cells as well as he helper T cells remember they have T cell receptors and T cell receptors are unique in how they are formed just like how B cell receptors or antibodies are T cell receptors bind both the self uh, MHC and the foreign peptide as well so they recognize the MHC and they recognize foreign peptides TCRs and MHCs bind directly to the pep, uh, peptide antigen both of these uh, bind to the peptide antigens so you see here uh, we have MHC1 on a nucleated cell presenting antigen to a T cell 
uh, this would be a cytotoxic T cell since that's MHC1. And notice how the T cell receptor is not only recognizing the antigen you see here, it's recognizing antigen, but it's also part of it, uh, part of the variable domain is also recognizing MHC1. So how is the genetic diversity generated with TCRs? Well, again, similar to that of B cell receptors, you have somatic recombination, random chain reassortment, and coding for joint diversity. Here you can see there's the beta chain genes and the alpha chain genes. Uh, you have different variable regions, like 52 different variable regions to choose from. You have a, a diversity region and then a joining region, one through six to choose from as well, followed by a constant region. The alpha chain, same thing. You have 80 different variables. You have joiners, the 61 different joining and a constant region. So again, the, as we reviewed in the virtual whiteboard, the cytotoxic T cells, also known as TC cells, or cytotoxic T lymphocytes, CTLs, either way, you know, both names work, are T cells that directly kill cells that display foreign antigen on MHC1, the nucleated cells that are displaying foreign antigen on MHC1. Contact between TC cells and target cell is required for cell death. Upon contact, remember the granules and perforin uh, uh, destroy the cell. Perforin perforates the membrane and the granzymes uh, promote apoptosis or program cell death. Here you can see what I had drawn earlier on the virtual whiteboard. You have a target cell. This is a diseased cell, either cancerous or virally infected cell presenting on MHC1 foreign antigen, which is recognized by the cytotoxic T cell with its very specific T cell receptor, which, which recognizes the antigen as well as the MHC1 protein. And then granzymes or granules are released uh, for programmed cell death as well as perforin to perforate the cell membrane. Now, you don't really need to know uh, too much detail about this for the exam right here, but I do want to make it clear that there's more than one type of helper T cell. There are what's known as Th1 cells, helper T cell 1, and then helper T cell 2. Helper T cell 1, these, these are a subset of helper T cells that activate macrophages in order to secrete cytokines. Helper T cell 2, these are the ones that play a crucial role in B cell activation. And then you have helper T cell 17s, which play a role in dendritic cells and the Treg cells, which play a role if there is no interaction with pathogen and dendritic cells. Again, you don't need to know the differences between Treg, T17, T1, uh, Th2. Uh, I just pointed out to show you that there is a lot of diversity here between subsets of types of uh, T cells. And, and uh, immunology is a quite complex field. All right, to top off this chapter, we're going to talk a little bit about autoimmunity. Autoimmune disease occurs when B cells and T, and T cells are activated to produce immune reactions against self. You know, you don't want to attack yourself, but this is what happens in autoimmune disease. Uh, you have T cells and B cells recognizing self antigens and targeting self. This results in tissue damage and tissue rejection, let's say post-tissue uh, transplant. Some diseases are caused by these autoantibodies. Then remember superantigens. I just want you to know that superantigens are proteins capable of eliciting a very strong response, uh, immune response because they activate more T cells than a normal immune response. All right, and that about wraps up this chapter. Hopefully that ma was made clear for you uh, the, the impressive action of the adaptive or specific immune system and how, you know, it, it uses these really, really interesting, very specific interactions between receptors on the surface and specific antigens in order to give us, you know, an improving immune system with time and with exposure. I think it's, it's a fascinating field. 
uh, but also very complex. I hope you learned a lot. As always, let me know if you have any uh, questions or comments in the box below, and I'll catch you guys next time. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D.